My name is Hania de Silva, and with all the other three speakers, we're going to have this panel. Uh, we're going to start with a few introductions. So, as I said, my name is Hania de Silva. I'm from Brazil, and I have a bachelor's as applied mathematician. Uh, I now work as a community officer for the Software Assembly Institute in Manchester, UK. Uh, I contribute to volunteer for some projects that teach people how to program, including software carpentry, data carpentry. I went to a workshop from the Jungle's Girls this year in Manchester. And if you want to keep in touch with me online, it's R G A I A C S in most of the places. So I go to hand out to Alice. Um, okay, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Southampton. Um, so I'm an astrophysicist, so in my day-to-day -day work, I model explosions on neutron stars. Um, so I kind of wanted to take part in this because um, I'm a fairly recent learner, so I only started programming at the beginning of my undergraduate course. Um, and I've experienced lots of different programming courses. So I had courses from computer scientists, which were kind of okay, but very fast paced, and I really struggled with them. Um, but I also had courses from physicists, and they were in general absolutely awful. And it was like, here's some code, change a few lines, now you can program. Um, so yeah, kind of, I have a mix of experiences there. Um, and then more recently, during my PhD, I've been a demonstrator in both software carpentry courses and undergraduate programming courses, so numerical methods for kind of mathematicians. Um, and yeah, if you want to see me on Twitter, I'm up there. Thank you, Alice. So uh, we're going to hand out to Mateusz. Okay, uh, my name is Mateusz Kuzak. I work at Netherlands eScience Center. Uh, so in my day job, uh, I'm involved in writing research software. But I work a lot with researchers, and I got involved in teaching researchers programming, like teaching them best programming practices, because I, I think it's really needed. I got involved in software carpentry, and I teach software carpentry, data carpentry workshops, recently also library carpentry, so we teach librarians about programming, uh, mostly research librarians. Uh, and I also train instructors now, and I mentor new instructors, and I'm involved in the steering committee of software carpentry, so if you want to ask me anything about carpentries, yeah. Thanks, Mateus. Celine. So hello everyone. Um, so I'm trained as a software engineer from uh, Insta Paritech in France, uh, but I think I learned my first computing concept by myself when I realized I could program my calculator because else nobody was teaching me anything else than PowerPoint or <laughs> Word. Um, since then, I've been working in uh, robotics and computer science, um, and now I'm. Uh, so I was, for instance, part of uh, the Ask Now project uh, at Aldebron. Uh, we were uh, programming apps on robots and websites uh, to help children with autism. Uh, now I'm involved in uh, Code for Life, so I'm the team lead at Ocado for Code for Life, a project uh, where we create online coding games to teach all children um, computing. So it's, uh, it's a different but interesting challenge to not to be like on site, but to program online games for uh, people that you don't really see. Um, and also that's not about programming, but I'm also a volunteer uh, to teach children creative writing at the Ministry of Story in London. But that's also an interesting teaching experience. Thank you. So I'm going to join all our speakers. So let's start with uh, this question. If you could send a letter to your past self uh, bef one month before you have your first teaching experience, and by teaching experience, I mean if you go for a workshop, or if you're trying to write a tutorial online, or if you're trying to write a course, or a book, or anything that's related with teaching, uh, what you would write on that letter for you one month before your first experience? Uh, do you want to start, Celine? Yeah, so I think I would probably write myself to first never take anything for granted. <laughs> we tend to assume a lot of things and none of them are real. <laughs> so expect the unexpected, 
just you know can happen so i would say for instance um, i had some interesting experiences uh, in schools for the autism project when we realized that the teachers couldn't use our web applications um, because of all the protocols that were in the school and preventing them from accessing our website so, oh we should have checked before, but that was a while ago. Um, <laughs> also, that um, some some trainings that we are creating right now for co from Code for Life, and that uh, we thought were really like five to eleven. We realized that they were also used a lot in secondary schools because there's also a lack of skills there. So there are a lot of unexpected things happening, and you have to be prepared to um, to literally everything. Okay. Uh, so, when I started teaching, actually, I didn't teach programming. I, I've been teaching at the university uh, to biologists. Uh, but I think, like, something that I didn't expect, I did, I, I started teaching because I had to do teaching at my, the, during my PhD training. Uh, and I didn't expect that I will actually enjoy it that much. So, that would be maybe like, it's act, like in the letter that is actually fun and I shouldn't worry too much about it. I think that's the, the main message. And, and I really like the, 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 if something is going, like if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Yeah, just like don't stress too much about it. Um, I think that for me, so I, very recently I ran the first course where I'd written the material for the course myself and I was like the leader of the course rather than just a demonstrator. And um, something that would have been very useful to think a bit more about in advance is having loads of examples and loads of exercises for the students um, because to really get people to interact with things, exercises are just, that, that it's just so much better than just standing and showing people things. And we ended up having to like make up exercises on the fly, which is really not great. So just having loads of exercises prepared would have been very helpful. Thank you, Alice and everyone. Uh, I really enjoy that you say, like, including lots of exercise and examples in your first workshop. But as anyone that has any experience teaching, uh, you probably know that lots and lots of things that you want to include on your first material. So this is a little technical, but since we are on the uh, PyCon conference, uh, we have the documentation, the Python documentation, where there is like the reference for the language and so on. So if you're going to prepare a teaching material or teaching a workshop, what do you do included? Like what was never, never going to remove from your course or something and one extra thing that you're probably going to skip from the Python library or something that your own material. Do you want to start, Alice? Yeah so, um, so yeah, so I teach coding to scientists. Um, and for them, the most important thing is to get really using NumPy and doing plotting very early on, because then they can relate it back to their work. Um, and certainly less important for them is learning about classes and object-oriented programming, because this is a completely alien concept to them. And they're, I mean, they can write perfectly good scientific programs without ever having to do any classes. Um, and we certainly found when we were teaching this, this is just a step too far for them, um, and they found it just way too confusing. <laughs> um, yeah, so in Code for Life, it's uh, interesting because since we were mostly for children, first we have to follow the UK curriculum uh, because it's mostly a UK-based uh, program at first. Um, and we realized soon that the most important things for teachers is to teach logical thinking and to uh, help the kids understand that rather than actual syntax. So we put more emphasis on the coding concept. So that's why actually we start with Blockly and then we teach Python. Um, so there are a lot of things obviously that we don't teach from Python. So not a lot of, I would say, most complicated data structures like dictionaries or even arrays are kept out of the loop because it's not uh, for the 5 to 11 yet. Uh, we don't really teach object oriented yet, but we do teach functions. Um, we don't teach um, the other data like error management or things like that. So it's just about the algorithm, the logical thinking and uh, how you can do that in Python in a very simple way. Okay. So when I teach to life scientists or to research librarians, I think it's like something between physicists and a child. 
Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> because it, so the the level of the I think the the physicists are much more advanced in terms of the, they they have been introduced to programming before and they know something, and life scientists are like really they don't like they are afraid to approach it. But they also, because they're researchers, they're really focused on like what they will take away. Like they're investing time in it, so they have to get something back, and that's why you can't start with uh, introducing. I don't know. The, the, this is integer. This is boolean. This is the list. That won't like they won't buy it. You have to start with something which is like really eye-opening and uh, like the wow moment. Show them amazing plot. Show them how you can very efficiently do something, and then maybe introduce a little bit of basics, but actually just hope that they will come home and they will be so motivated, they will start learning by themselves. But we lost a lot of, I, I've, I've tried like, in various ways doing it, but if you start with introducing, like, don't show them the Python reference, that's the, like number one, I think, advice, uh, but show them, amazing things that they can do, and then they will learn from there. Thank you. I really enjoyed that you could make the comparison about life science and teaching to kids. So if you could go a little deep on that, it would be nice. Uh, so what do you think is like a big difference when you need to approach uh, people in different ages and backgrounds, like kids, uh, undergrad students, PhD students, software developers, like, there's any suggestions like motivate people of different backgrounds or which approach do you think that's interesting for motivate and explain better some of the concepts? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think like depending who you're approaching, you really have to target the, uh, your content and like how do you deliver the content. Uh, you, if you, like you're teaching children, you want to make it fun. Uh, you're, with researchers, it's really like the, the time is the, the, most, like, the most important thing they have. They, they drive the research, publish papers, so they have to see what they get from it. Uh, for, I've never taught programmers or engineers. Actually, my title is e-science research engineer. I've been, I, I've been working as a science research engineer for, I think, five years now. I do, still don't know what e-science is, and I'm not an engineer. Uh, but I do write research software. Uh, and with kids, so I, I really would like to learn like, how to teach kids. Uh, I, I've never done it, actually, so it's, uh, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, indeed, making it fun is very important, but I think the key moment is probably making it grounded, so grounded to something that they might like, but grounded, I would say, in real life or with um, a visual example or even a sound example, like Sonic Pi is doing with TTGM programming, with music. Uh, for instance, what we do in Code for Life, they have to program a van to go alongside the road to make deliveries. Uh, the thing is, uh, it makes it fun because they see, oh, okay, so if I know about programming, maybe later on I can also program games like that, I can actually have fun, it's more like really a game than actually teaching, they just want to solve the challenge. Um, and it works well for actually making pro them understand the logical thinking and the concept, as I was saying before, that is more important for them than just the syntax. So, for instance, in the first levels of uh, Rapid Rotor, you only have like um, several, a very small amount of instructions they can use, like move forward, turn left, etc. And they have to program a very complicated role. So later, when we introduce like repeat loops, it makes sense for them because they actually know that they need the concept to <laughs> make their life easier. So we just grounded knowledge, and I think it works really well for kids. Um, yeah, so I think definitely for physicists and mathematicians, they really just want to see that there is going to be some use for these programming skills at some future point. Um, so last year in Southampton, um, for the first time, we had a, um, a Python course for the first year mathematicians. Um, and the biggest error was that this course was optional. Um, <laughs> and so after two weeks, the students cottoned on to this and they just stopped attending the labs full stop because they're like, this isn't maths, so I'm not going to use this. Um, and the notes were written in such a way that it just didn't relate to their course and they didn't think that they have any future use for this. Um, so really, certainly for mathematicians and physicists, and by the sounds of it, basically everyone, you need to kind of relate it back to their own experience and show them that there's going to be some worth to what they're learning. Thank you. Uh, 
This is a panel, so uh, if you feel that you have any questions, you can just come to the front and then uh, we can uh, uh, listen to your question uh, at any moment. But continuing this, uh, if you probably remember from the uh, keynote from today, she was recommended a video from a few years ago from PyCon saying uh, that every program or most of the programs are mediocre. And I think we, as teachers, we also meet with you, Chris. So uh, do you want to share any uh, teaching experience that was not uh, amazing? Yeah, uh, OK. Uh, I think, so, so I think what is uh, very important, so I don't remember like very specific. I think when I stress out too much and uh, I wanted to make it too perfect, then it probably will go wrong. Uh, and I think the, m the most important thing is, so I, I don't have a good example of like where, when things went wrong, but you have to, w one thing, you have to be prepared that thing, things will go wrong. But also, uh, like I feel I'm in the same way learner as the learners who I teach. I learn so much during teaching that and every workshop, every event that I'm teaching uh, is the opportunity to learn. So if the things go wrong, it's just so that I can learn how to do it better. And it's mostly like how to troubleshoot things, how, like, how to deal with situations that... Like first you learn how to deal with situations that come up and then you learn to deal with unexpected, yes? Or like you get better in handling unexpected things happening. Um, so yeah, so again, relatively new to leading teaching sessions, and I ran a workshop uh, quite recently, um, and I prepared all the material on my office Linux computer, but I was delivering the workshop on my own Mac laptop, and I was like, oh, all well, this stuff's going to work. Um, it did not all work. I tested all the hard stuff, all the stuff that was like live coding, I tested that, but the kind of simple stuff I had not tested, assuming it would work, and that was a massive error on my part. <laughs> I think that um, for me, the most um, things I took away from, it's not, I would say really failures, but it felt a bit like that at some point, it's about always think about the so accessibility and what you can do better for um, the users that are uh, in front of you or behind the computer. Um, so for instance, we uh, did a lot of user research for our coding games with Code for Life. And, uh, um, we realized that it was a good idea that we were working on an iOS app for our game because there are some kids that can't really use a mouse, for instance, so all the things that you need to think about. So if you have like a real life workshop, you might want to understand that it might happen. Um, but more important, also when I was working for uh, kids with autism um, with the Now Robot, so we had set up a, a big session in a classroom in Birmingham uh, with the robot and all the class, with the kids and the teachers, etc. Of course, everything went wrong first because of the network. So we were like basically SSHing into the robot and trying to do a lot of crazy stuff from there. And we were sweating like hell, but it worked. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, things we hadn't realized, um, uh, our robot was speaking in American English. <laughs> Um, and there was a game where the robot was um, asking, uh, was imitating uh, playing football and he was asking which sport am I imitating and he was uh, listening to the answer from the kids and one of the kids answered football and the robot was like, no, you're wrong, it was soccer. So the kid is like, but, 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 uh, yeah, you were right, sorry. And the, the thing is that um, kids with autism uh, tend to be very sensitive against um, uh, social injustice and things like that. So I really felt awful for having <laughs> participated in that. So you need to really, yeah, you need to really um, know that um, you will have to think about fallback and um, make the, the kids feel uh, okay, that it's okay, it's not their fault or it's fine not to make uh, errors or things feel like too much of a failure. So it's it's more like a, yeah, teaching practice. So. Thank you. I really enjoy when you say about uh, accessibility because most of the conference, uh, just I go back to your question just one moment. Uh, Stephen? Uh, Stephen? Uh, 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 
come back to accessibility. Uh, most of the conference, they are trying to uh, be inclusive and so on. And here on this stage, we have two vegans, one gluten-free and one lactose intolerant. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you have any uh, recommendations for accessibility in terms of uh, workshops or any teaching material? Because I remember when I'm teaching and like some of things that I'm worried is like make the font very big enough for everyone in the room can actually read without difficult. And do you want to start, Celine? Um, so, for for instance, um, online resources or yeah, visual games, for instance, that would be pay attention to um, to UX user experience and details such as uh, the contrast. So make sure that if you write something, it's not like dark grey on black, because sometimes it looks cool, but people just can't read it. And people can have be visually impaired, etc. Um, also, if you have games with too much sounds and different sounds and things like that, as well as visual, etc., it can be a bit distracting. So, for instance, um, uh, children with autism might have a hard time um, not feeling stressed with your game. Um, but sometimes, if they like one of the sounds that's the contrary, they will try, for instance, to fail so that they can get the failure sound. <laughs> so, you might want to pay attention to that too. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, also things like, of course, a mouse or a screen, try to find about different ways that you can make um, engage with your uh, materials. So, um, there are also other things that you can try, like board games that teach coding. So, it's not only has to be about computers or, um, or tablets, actually. Um, so, yeah, I would say just pay attention to that, but I would say the real deal is that um, try to understand which, um, what you might um, encounter, what can happen if you, if you can talk to the to, to educators before that uh, deal with, for instance, uh, children, if you want to, or just the group of people you're going to teach to uh, understand if there are any such uh, requirement and try to just talk with them to see how you can make them feel comfortable and adapt your uh, materials to that. Uh, so, when we teach uh, software carpentry, especially if you, if, when we train new instructors, we want them to make an experiment, like if they're going to organize the workshop, to get from the from the airport to the venue by the uh, with the wheelchair and see like what what is on the way like what what all the barriers are on the way and it's actually like we sometimes we think uh, like un until we try to actually do it uh, we don't realize how many obstacles there are, there are in the way so we we really have to make more effort like do this extra work to realize. Uh, how hard or not hard it actually is. I think it's a it's very interesting experiment. Actually, I've never done it actually. But I, I think, like, just starting thinking about it. So I never did it with, with actual wheelchair, but just like when you start thinking about it, like, how do you get out of this bus and get to the venue? Uh, I think it's really interesting. Okay, so this might be, as we have quite an international audience here, this might be slightly more obvious to everyone else, but um, I, when I was at un undergrad and before that, I was always in an all-native English speaker environment, and I just, I'd never really communicated or looked, like mixed much with people from other countries, so I was completely unaware that I naturally speak very quickly, and I use quite a lot of maybe technical or like less clear vocabulary that for non-native speakers is quite difficult. Um, and I've noticed a lot in classes, um, there'll be some people so there'll be people just starting their master's courses and then have been in Britain for maybe two weeks when they go to their first class. And I start trying to explain things to them and they really struggle. So I remember there was one thing and I was telling them to, put, um, to type something them dot, so full stop. And they just didn't understand. I was like, dot. And yeah, so definitely trying to really make sure you use very clear language um, and for me yeah it was a real eye-opener because I just was completely unaware of this before I'd started my PhD um, quite how difficult it is in terms of languages um, but yeah. Can I, can I add to that? Because it, that reminded me one thing so very often we like when, when we uh, try to help people with uh, so as an example uh, we add the subtitles to help people with, uh, with hearing problems. We're actually 
without realizing we're helping much more people that we targeted because of the, the, these cases we have people giving talks with strange accents or like difficult to understand or with v speaking very fast will help people uh, who just like they can't keep up uh, on the way so I think it's uh, it's also nice that it's it's wider impact uh, I'm sorry, I'm also thinking of something else. Um, <laughs> I would say also if you organize a, a workshop, because I also participate in some meetups, and um, the struggle is also always to find a good time, for instance, for the events. So if you organize your events or your workshop at a specific time or day of the week, you might not get uh, the same uh, amount of participation that you might expect depending on who your targets are. So for instance, if you want to, um, if you want to make something at like 4 p.m., you probably will never reach people that might be working, etc. So just pay attention to, to that. Thank you. Uh, do you want to ask your question? Thank you. Uh, you uh, do you want to comment? Yeah, sure. Um, so I mentioned before that in Southampton we were trialing these first year Python courses. Um, so the demonstrators for these courses were PhD students. Um, and I think I'm probably the only PhD student in the maths department that actually used this Python. So you had all the demonstrators for this Python course and not one of them could actually do Python. Um, so recently they actually ran a course to teach the demonstrators Python so that when these students turn up the lab, to the lab and have questions, they actually have someone there who knows what they're doing. Because um, otherwise they're turning up, they couldn't get any help. They were just so discouraged that uh, I'm not surprised that they all stopped coming after the second week. Matthias, Aslin, do you want to add something? Uh, no, I'm here. Yeah. No? Uh, yeah. yeah, in the front. Yeah, I have a question that probably has occurred to many people teaching. So what are you actually using to accommodate for a course for an audience that is very heterogeneous where you have total beginners and people with a background in computer science for instance? Thank you for the very good question. I think that one of the suggestions that you're going probably uh, hear from everyone is that try to pair people that are more experienced with more novice, try to balance, but I go to pass the word for the other speakers. Do you want to? Yeah, it works too. Even for, for children, some of them will have like uh, different um, types of knowledge or previous knowledge. And so if you pair them together, uh, the child which, is, um, which knows more will also feel valued uh, and will work quite well. And the other kid will probably also learn a lot through talking to the other one. So actually that works for uh, heterogeneous levels, even with different ages, etc. So. Yeah, so... I also do that and it works really well pairing people the less advanced with more advanced but also like more general advice is um, for you don't want to lose the the novices so you really have to you rather slow down they go faster but then you're risking that you're going to lose people who are more advanced you have to make them busy and you have to make them feel important and like so that they, they will want to in, uh, engage. So one, one way is m making them the men, like mentoring other people or like give them some tasks, like some extra exercises or let them make notes or like let them comment or something on the materials that you have. So that they have to get, be busy and they have to have something which uh, like it is important. It gi gives something back. Yeah. So then, then they feel like they have a role here, and it's very easy to lose them also because they will get discouraged. It's like there is nothing for them to learn here. Yeah. That, so that's my advice. 
Um, yeah, that's kind of what I was going to say. So just having exercises where it's like, oh, you finished this, this was easy, now try the slightly harder thing. Um, because, yeah, it's so easy for the more advanced students to get bored and just completely lose interest. And that's terrible because, like, they're very, they're obviously quite talented, so you don't, you want them to continue and be infused by this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes we, all, yeah, I would, just a second. Just one moment. We have one question there, and then we go to you. Uh, but are you going to comment? I, I wanted to add to that. So in, in Carpentry's workshops, we have helpers. So sometimes if the person like that is really advanced, uh, just make him a helper. Yeah, that's, uh, that works great. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I thought Mate was going to say, but uh, in software and data carpentry, normally we give a pink and a green sticker for each one of the students. And we ask them to put the pink sticker when, if you have any issue, like, oh, something on this command is not working, there's an error, and I need uh, help to solve that, or, oh, uh, I still need more time to finish the exercise. And the green stickers, when they are okay, like, oh, I finished the exercise. So this is very useful for us as instructors because uh, we can go to one of the students that finished the exercise and say, oh, do you want to try to make this other change of people that already finished, they can say, oh, my colleague at my uh, side, they, he needs some help, so he can start in talking. Uh, do you want to add something about it? No? Nope. So we're going to the uh, guy on the... Yes? There were like three, yeah. I just wanted to add to this topic. Um, I agree that you have to make them better, better than they are. Yes. And you have to make them better busy, like adding optional tasks for them, that's fine. But I don't exactly agree with uh, pairing with uh, beginners with more advanced because uh, sometimes it happens that the advanced also make a mistake, so a cluster of people get the same mistake. So we try to uh, cluster the people advanced with advanced, so we don't have to care about them that much, because they can handle most of the simpler tasks, and we can focus on the uh, less advanced ones. And the uh, chances of uh, the same mistake spreading is much lower than Thank you. Uh, we're going to the guy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to comment, anyone? Oh, Celine, no, Celine, you want to say something? Just, just one thing. I think um, the thing of who you pair with also depends on the type of the exercises that you're making. So I think indeed that's a, that's a, that's a really good if you're doing something when you know that there might be mistakes, etc. But if it's just um, trying to, to help someone solve an exercise and thinking about it together, etc., I think that actually works better. So it really depends on the type. Thank you. Going to I, I can, the question. Can oh. I add more, <laughs> one <Sorry>. more here? <laughs> uh, so I have a counter argument actually. So very often, like I, I see it myself. Very often, if you have to explain, you think you understand something, you think you yes. know yes. well, and you try to explain it to someone, and you realize like I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about, or like I don't, like I, I was wrong. Like when I try to think about, it, because you have to think about it much deeper if you want to uh, explain it. So that might help. But I agree with you that in some cases that might be, yeah. Maybe the key, yeah, can we give someone else? Yeah, yeah, please. instead of 
explaining things at the novelist level. And so that's an issue you have to address. Mm -hmm. Do you have it? So I have an answer to that, actually. So one way we try to avoid it, and I, I'm also guilty of that, yeah? So I have a tendency of like trying to overpower. So if, if I, I, I need to show someone something, I will try to take over the keyboard. This is something that we never allow to take over the keyboard or never take over the keyboard yourself. You sit back and you explain to the person who's learning. And I think that this helps a lot with it. So. You, then you have to adjust to the pace of the novice, and you're not allowed to, uh, yeah, overpower basically the person. Uh, Tony. Um, so yeah, so our undergraduate, um, I had these supervisions where you'd be put in groups of two or three, and then you discuss your homework with um, a PhD student or a tutor. Um, and for one of my computer science courses, I was paired with a couple of computer scientists. And as a physicist who'd only been coding for a month, I was completely lost. Um, the supervisions were entirely at their pace. I sat there feeling completely stupid, not understanding anything, and it was awful. And I had to go and beg to be paired with someone who was more like my level. And after that, it was so much better, but it was the worst experience ever. Um, so I think that could have been helped a lot um, if the person who was leading the tutorial had actually encouraged me to speak up because I didn't get everything wrong. Um, I mean, I felt like I did, but um, if I'd have been encouraged to actually speak up, because I didn't feel confident speaking in front of these people who I felt knew everything and I didn't. Um, so really, if I'd have been encouraged a lot more, it would have helped. But yeah, there's definitely dangers of pairing mixed abilities in that way. No, just one moment, Celine, do you want to say something? Something which is not related to teaching coding, but teaching creative writing at the Ministry of Stories. So um, uh, I was taking care of um, two child, two children. Uh, they were supposed to work on something like creating a poem or a story about their pets or something like that. And one of the little girls was like completely uh, unresponsive. She looked like really sad and I asked her, are you okay, what happened? And she would just wouldn't answer. Um, the other kids were not really paying so much attention to her. So it was quite difficult to just not make her work, but just really make her um, happy and think what was going wrong and what can I do to help her. And at some point the other kids um, I, I was with, just started to literally take over. And since she's also a kid, it actually also made, made sense that, um, she, that she, she would do that, so she wouldn't feel indeed uh, maybe the distance with me, for instance. And she started to sit next to the other little girl and say, okay, it's fine. Uh, what did you want to write about? Your cat. Okay, let's start with that sentence. And she literally started the story and the other kid got engaged into it and actually finished a pretty amazing uh, story by the end of the session. So I was like, yeah, that's awesome. So it happened without me, but yeah, that was quite, quite interesting. So, thank you to raise like that. Sometimes it can be dangerous to people when you pair them, especially when you force them to be working pairs. Uh, something that not, sometimes we uh, suggest is that people attend a workshop in groups, especially like universities or other uh, work, uh, community workshops, because if you have someone that it's your friend, maybe you're going to be less scary or more friendly to like keep on the same pace of the other people and enjoy. Do you want to uh, comment anything else? Uh, uh, who was, okay, uh, just get out. So the guy on the black t-shirt and the, the other guy and then you later. Um, yeah, so I would say, for instance, games and making them understand that they can hike into Minecraft or just help shape the world at some point by either creating website or creating games themselves, so just related to something they enjoy. Um, it really make a lot of sense for them, so they just want to, to go on and create something. Also, um, sometimes they want to do it because they want to impress like their friends, etc., but 
I think it also works better in the long term if you can make understand those real life example. Uh, Sonic Pi, I was saying before, is also useful because the example is about music. So for kids that also like that, it's um, they really uh, learn concept and sometimes quite advanced concepts, even like threads and things like that. They can <laughs> that actually makes sense when they start to uh, program music with it. Um, so I would say, yeah, things that are really grounded and uh, in areas that um, they would enjoy. So you can always ask them, like, what do you like in life? And you can always obviously find an example where programming might be useful and you can just um, try to, to explain. For instance, when I was a kid, I didn't know much about computing, but I was uh, really interested in uh, so many different things like uh, archaeology or art or, um, uh, or so physics. <laughs> um, and I realized later that actually all those areas could be linked with computing because you could be uh, a programmer and work in all those different areas. So it's just the cross, uh, all the cross-domain uh, possibility of computing, which is amazing. Uh, so, uh, sir, your question, please. I just want this topic to flip a little bit. What do you recommend to find out in your class what are the skill levels, what are the interests, and what, what, where are they? Great question. Um, so, for a workshop that um, I helped out with recently, um, we had a survey beforehand. Um, so it was a very short survey to try and encourage people to actually fill it out. So I think there were five questions and it just asked um, what kind of experience people had, so whether they've been, like how often they did programming, um, what languages they'd maybe experienced before, and also what they wanted to get out of the course, so kind of what they were interested in learning, because that really meant that we could tailor the course to their needs and requirements. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so for the Carpentries workshop, the survey is there. Uh, you can also just have some kind of uh, questions, do formative assessment to get an idea. I think it, it works really well. Uh, now you have these applications with the clickers so that people can answer quickly A, B, C, D, and you look at the distribution of the answers and you can adjust. So you start, start the workshop with 10, que 10 easy questions and you will have some overview of the levels in the group and then you can go from there. Um, in Code for Life, we have something interesting in Rapid Router, which is it's still online and not seeing people. But uh, actually, we have like coins that you can uh, win after each level. Um, so you can win a coin if you manage to finish the level, but you can win other coins if uh, you manage to like sort of optimize it a bit. So then uh, all the teachers which are registered to Code for Life can see um, all the coins that their students have, and it's also easier for them to understand at a quick glance after like a first session uh, who's advance and who's not and try to make the effort uh, later on in the right direction. Just addition, uh, I go to her and then uh, just addition uh, is that sometimes it can be very, very difficult to just assess how much people know because if you have something that's very long, people are not going to fill the survey and if you have open uh, open questions like you don't get the answers that you want. For me, something that was very useful was like if you have a breakfast before the workshop where people come, then you can start to talk with people and at least you ask a few questions and then you can have a better, not 100% better, but you have idea of what was previous experience from people and so on, so you can prepare a little of yourself, what are your expectations and what are the expectations of people that are coming for the workshop. Uh, do you want? So I think one advice is if you have those questions for the, for the assessment at the beginning, you have to be very specific in those questions. Yeah? So you ask about specific things because first people are very bad in judging how good they are and the novices don't know what they don't know. So they, they really if you, if, you, you, if you want to get some good idea, the, it, it has to be, have you ever used the terminal window or things like that, they, then they can answer. Yeah. <clears throat> I, sorry, yeah, I think it's also like, uh, I don't know if you were at the keynote by uh, Tracy Osborne, but there were some very interesting there also about the fact that it's not just beginner, um, advanced, etc., but it can be a lot of different topics, so I completely agree with that. For instance, in uh, Rapid Router, where we teach different concepts, like if statement, for loops, etc., 
Um, I say it's quite easy to see with the coins you earn which concept you might know or not, and it's really like that, the drop down of the concepts and understand which one they understand or not, and then uh, trying to understand how you can um, really teach that, that notion. But not just, yeah, are you good at Blockly, are you good at Python, the kids are like, I don't know, uh, it's normal. <laughs> Thank you. So we go to the lady at the back, then we're going to you, and then you, okay? So first, I think it, it really helps if the group, so if you have a set of instructors and helpers, it helps if like, the more heterogeneous they are, the better, because then you can always fit in to different target audience. Uh, and I think, the, the other thing is, uh, it, I hope it answers your question, but uh, we try to, f like we think that Peop, uh, the best for teaching are actually people not very advanced. Yeah, so it has to be people who who are not novices anymore, but they they still remember how it is to be a novice, and then they don't feel too competent. Let's say so they they have to be I mean, they have to feel competent, but they they're not they still remember, and they, it's easier for them to put themselves in the shoes of the of the learners. I think that helps really well. So at the workshops, uh, at the carpentry's workshops, we invite very often people who just they just did the workshop, and we see that they're like more advanced. We encourage them to go forward and become instructors, or maybe first come as a helper, and then the second time come, uh, come as the instructor. It's very easy to forget, when you get, you get too advanced, to forget how it is, and like what kind of questions you had, what kind of challenges there are. In uh, the Ministry of Stories, Sorry. we also have something uh, that we do at the beginning of a session. Uh, we take the exercise that the kids are going to make, and we try to apply ourselves to it very shortly by uh, drawing something in relation to, to the theme. So, uh, for instance, um, it's like just a nice breaker that we do at the beginning of the session with kids and we do it also ourselves uh, as the adult volunteers and then we show the kids what we have come up with so that can be for instance draw a building uh, and at each floor you put like your favorite books or things that you liked about some books etc and we all are very actually keen to do the drawings ourselves and we tend to be pretty uh, pretty dedicated to it but then in the end it's also the kids know that you have done it too um, that you are just not above that and that it's actually not a dumb exercise, for instance, so it also helps to put yourself in their shoes and try to spark your own creativity before. Um, so I think um, teaching the teachers um, is definitely important. So, um, I mean, software carpentry, before you do your, become an instructor, you have instructor training. Um, and the material from there is like from a more educational perspective. So it's people who know about education and know about education concepts and they teach you all of these things. Um, and so yeah, at Southampton before I did any demonstrating, we had to go and we had to do a course um, and it was taught by education people. And I mean, I hated it. We all hated it at the time, but it did at least because we were like, we know how to teach, it's easy. Um, but no, I mean, it did at least make us think about different things that you wouldn't otherwise think about. So how to deal with um, like less able students and mixed abilities and stuff. And so yeah, definitely at least trying to teach the educators a bit more, I think helps. Uh, so th this is something that uh, the carpentries we really think like we want teachers to learn from each other. That's why we never teach alone in the, in the class. Yeah, there's always other teacher. We, uh, 
learn how to get feedback on the teaching. Every workshop, we, after the workshop, we sit down and we discuss and we get feedback from, from helpers, from learners. We collect the feedback from the learners and we try to improve teaching. We believe that teachers are not born, they're made. Like you have to, everyone sucks at the beginning. Like the first lesson you suck and you just, that's, and you improve and the next workshop you're better, the next workshop you're better and you learn what you suck the most at and then you try to improve that and you, you learn from other learners. We try to, I, I uh, try to teach always, like always with a new people. So I like going to other, to other places for the workshop so that I can teach with someone else and learn their style. Everyone has his own learning style. There is no one way of learning, of teaching. Yeah? So everyone teaches in some other way. They, they have their, their style. And, yeah. yeah uh, I, uh, OK, sorry. It's not really. Yeah. So, yeah, I, sorry. I um, on the thing about getting to know your pupils, one of the things that I've done with adults is ask them what, in writing, uh, like little post-it cards or whatever, what are your biggest fears about learning the program, learning whatever it is that I'm teaching them around computers? And a lot of them, it's like, I fear looking stupid, or I fear blowing up the computer. <laughs> and so if you understand, if you have them write those down and then let people know how common all of those fears are and let them know you're not going to blow it up <laughs> ahead of time. Somebody mentioned that after Tracy's talk and it reminded me. Yeah. It's really helpful for them to be able to get over those fears and see how common it is so that they can then let go and learn other stuff. get your opinion on when we talk about the Python programming course, uh, do you introduce version control and at what point do you? What's your experience on that? Um, so I think you can never really introduce it too early. Um, I mean, from my experience, I didn't learn version control until I started my PhD. And at that point, I'd done quite a lot of programming. I'd done a whole master's project in C++ um, and really suffered from not having used version control. It was awful. Um, and I mean, I feel once you explain to people how useful it is, it's really it's not that difficult a concept. I mean, understanding how Git works, that is, I mean, I have no idea. Um, but definitely just using basic version control, it's so useful. I really think it should be introduced like less than one. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I don't design the undergraduate courses. Um, if I did, I would introduce it earlier. Um, I, I don't think it's actually even in the curriculum at the moment, but now you've said that, I might have words because I know who writes the courses. Um, no, just that I was actually thinking at, after you talk actually to add some things in rapid router to teach the basics of version control to the kids because right now the only thing that they can do with their code is uh, save them so they can save a workspace uh, which is for instance they can start a level and save things but that's it it's just the same name etc but maybe we can find a better way to 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 teach them and still not being like too uh, too dry but yeah. The version control is uh, the uh, in the core curriculum for software carpentry. Uh, it's not for data carpentry. Uh, so yeah, we we try to teach. I find it very difficult to sell. People are uh, one one thing that I always show. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the PhD comic. Uh, if you have a research background, you pr probably do. There is uh, one cartoon which is. When they send, so there is a PhD student and a supervisor, and they send by email the, the PhD thesis back and forth, and it's like version one, version two, version 2.2, version final one, version final two, and uh, in the end, it's like a few lines of uh, uh, title, and that, that's how I, and, and they ask, and like, is it familiar to you? And then that's why we have version control. Uh, but it's, it's super difficult to sell uh, how I try to do it now. And I think, like, 
A lot of people will not agree with me, but I'm really happy that there is GitHub with the user interface where I can show researchers. Uh, this is, so GitHub uses Git in the back. You can use it like this, and I sell it as a collaborative tool. So that this is how you can collaborate with your other researchers. Uh, you can set up a website with like two clicks. You will have your, your personal website. And once they learn that, I hope that they will start learning what is actually behind it, the, uh, the Git. And I know that not, not everyone agrees because people think like we shouldn't be showing people GUI, yeah, like show them hardcore terminal. But I, I, I don't think it works. It just doesn't sell. So. So this was a personal experience for me. I teach Git a few times, uh, and most of the times I was using just one file. So I have like one readme file, and that's a Markdown file. And like we start in writing some things, and then we commit, then you go check out, then you send to GitHub, and so on. So learners they just get used to all the Git crypty uh, command line interface. But there was one. Uh, uh, one student on the last workshop, the student, she uh, asked me, so I still didn't get how useful is Git, like, or, or why I supposed to use that. And then, after talk with her, I understand what was my mistake. My mistake was that I was only use one file, because if I have only one file, probably I don't need to go back to the history, uh, it's just one file. Uh, I can just save with a different name and it's going to be fine. But then, if you have experience as a Python developer or just doing program in any other language, you know that's not going to work that way. Because once you save the file with a different name, then you need to change all your imports. So, in case of having like import foo, now you have to change all your imports to import foo 2, import foo 3, and so on. So, then I learned by being my mistake and like the next time I'm going to use at least two files to make that uh, learning difficult much more easy for the students to get. Uh, but yeah, I think that it would be nice to introduce Git at the very beginning, but still quite challenge, most because like as a completely novice that someone that never programmed, they don't see the advantage very far or very soon. Uh, do you still have a question or comment? Yeah. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Can you re rephrase that? I think that like it's it's very difficult to to say that because uh, it's a personal choice. I think like. I don't have any design skills. Uh, my, if I need to paint something, I'm very, very bad. But I think that maybe if I want to start work hard and improve my, I could. But it's going to take time. So it's like how much time I want to put that and trying to make me better. But uh, do you want to comment? Um, so yeah, so in first year undergraduate courses, quite often you see people um, who they really struggle. So in the first term, like they're struggling, you see them every single session, they turn up to every session and they struggle so much and you kind of wonder like, is this course for them? Like, should you really maybe talk to them? Um, but I mean, in my experience, in my first year when I did computer science, I struggled so much and it was just the course was pitched wrong. Um, because I didn't have the same background as other students and it just all went slightly too fast for me. So I kind of know that and I mean, now I write code, I, I program supercomputers. It, 
it wasn't just that I was not a good programmer, it's just the course was wrong for me. Um, so when I have students like that, I really just try to find other materials and other approaches to learning out there that I can point them to, because it might just be the course is not for them and they need a slightly different approach um, to learning these things. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I agree. I think this also relates to the, today's keynote. Uh, there are so many different ways to it, and uh, on the other hand, I also think this is not a programming problem. Yeah, this is like people like I w there are people who are very determined to become great cooks, and they will never become great cooks. Yeah, and and first, if they're so determined, probably if you tell them that they shouldn't, they will they won't listen to it anyways. Uh, and uh, I, but I think in the in, in the end, this is like so heterogeneous topic, word, and so on, that, like there are so many different ways, and, and also we have so many st stereotypes around it, that maybe they just have to find their own way of programming, yeah? yeah. Uh, that they will be amazing at, why not? Yeah, um, I don't know if you were at my, my talk on Tuesday, but I was uh, talking about um, Agathe, uh, who is um, a friend of mine and my boyfriend's best friend. She's, um, she was taught when she was young that she could never be any good at math or, the, or at programming. So some, someone told her that because she was a woman, but someone else just because thought she was uh, not any good and nothing would happen because she was bad at uh, theoretical mathematics. And they thought it meant that she could never be a developer. I guess, well, she's a developer now. And it's just also this idea of grounded mathematics or grounded knowledge that worked for her. So uh, just also remember that the memory works also in different ways. Some people have a visual memory, some uh, more auditory memory or a feeling memory, etc. So um, I think sometimes, yeah, it's mostly about the different teaching approaches that might work or not work. But I wouldn't dismiss someone as it's like it's not for you right now, and also it's awful when you hear that. So that's just. I got out the hand, so uh, we're going uh, to the guy. That then you, then you, then you. Sorry to <laughs> try to control the room too much. Uh, I just went to second Alice, and uh, there was on um, the keynote. She was saying, "I'm a uh, visual learner, and th sometimes this is the case of your friend." Most of all the courses they are trying to teach you with videos or um, audio or just text, and sometimes you need like more visual things to learn. And this remembers me like when I was on my undergrad doing the uh, introduction to calculus, and there was mostly two books that people was using. There was one book that was calculus almost for dummies, and there was another one that was like calculus for PhD students or postgraduate students and like depend of which one of the professors that you have the course he just pick one of the books and even if you have like all other suggestions uh, readings but that's the course of the the, uh, the book of the course so like you more or less need to read that and sometimes you struggle because you're not on the streams you are on the middle and then you don't know like sometimes it's the day that you feel very good because you did the exercise or sometimes like I spend two hours three hours almost a day trying this exercise and I still on the step zero so uh, yeah uh, do you want to comment? Yeah, Celine. Yeah, um, just also something that uh, teachers say they like most about uh, our rapid router game is our levels which are plucky to Python because it's a very visual way for the kids to have next to it the, the, the graphical programming of Blockly and the text programming of Python. So when they add a Blockly block, they can see directly what, it's going, what it looks like in Python. So it's just a way to introduce them to Python uh, without uh, going straight to it, for instance, and they can see that uh, it's the same, that it's just a concept expressed differently in a different language, and they have this, like, this visual thing going on, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you, yeah.
that struggle and get stuck and kind of eventually fall off. And I, and I don't know how to kind of get them to think about Googling or asking why the program doesn't work or looking for other unblockers. Uh, I think it's not just not just learning, it's as uh, our colleagues said before, it's like your fears. So some people are in fear because they're going to break the computer, they have fears for other reasons, like, oh, NSA is going to spy me just because I click on this button and so on. So uh, if you are really, uh, interested on ways to learn or ways to help more people to learn, there's a very good book called Seven Ways to Learn, Seven Tips for Learners. I can send you yeah, so uh, this is uh, w one of the things that we try to show is that you can make mistakes and actually like you learn through mistakes and we uh, so we actually like making mistakes when we teach yeah we we make a mistake and we say oh I have an error now yeah and I explain the error and I take the opportunity to actually teach more through the error, but I also introduce that there is nothing wrong, like errors are normal, the being, like making mistakes is normal, like computer doesn't explode, everything is fine. And it also applies to others. So I think this is uh, uh, the whole topic of like the fears of people. This is like, if you want people to learn, you have to first challenge their fears. And one of the things that I have with researchers, I'm, I'm a, big fan of open science, open research, uh, collaboration. Researchers are, like some at least, are very afraid of like m making the research open. They, they're afraid they'll be scooped, whatever. And, uh, or they, that also translates to like when they start programming, they will be afraid of putting their code out there on GitHub. And then we show them, okay, so you put your code on GitHub and it's like, the word didn't collapse, like it's all fine. It's not like everyone immediately looked at your code and got angry about it, like at you or something. No, it's, it's, it's fine, yeah, it's, it's okay. So I think this is something that you can try just to show that it's not, it's, it's fine. No? Um, yeah, so something that I notice in the undergraduate courses is you get some students and as soon as they're stuck, they put up their hand and I, every five minutes they'll put up their hands because they just don't know how to search for answers. Um, so I, we teach using Spider. Um, so I really, I always try to show them like this is how you find a the documentation. Then I explain to them this is how you read the documentation because if you've never seen it before, it's not that great. Um, and then I show them how to like play around with the terminal and like try out different values to really explore how things work. So yeah, definitely teaching people how to find the answers themselves is definitely a valuable thing to teach and include. Uh, uh, sorry, you um, in the front. You had a question. Go. No. Yeah. Sorry, Yeah. So on the back. Yeah. Uh, you on the green t-shirt.
you and then you on the black one. Just yeah, yeah. So okay. I agree with you. Sometimes you just need to stop thinking about the problem. Uh, any comments from? Yeah. So speaking of which, we also so we teach children, but we also have to teach the teachers first, right? Because we our games are mostly used in coding clubs and uh, mostly schools, and sometimes the teachers themselves are the ones which actually are not confident uh, with their skills. They don't know sometimes why they have to teach coding. It's just because the UK curriculum says they have to, but they don't necessarily see the point themselves. Uh, think the kids might be better than them, and usually it's actually the case, so they actually, all their fears, they're speaking of fears, they have all of them, so that's why we're trying to also break down all the exercises to uh, make it sound like it's not magical. I think it's important because there's, like at the keynote this morning, it's not something like you want to look like you're an expert and blah, 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 but at some point if people think that it's an area they can never reach into, um, there's a problem. Um, so for instance, in, in my team, uh, we have a UX designer, uh, which uh, actually has um, some front-end knowledge, but he stopped uh, becoming, uh, he stopped doing programming because he didn't feel confident at all. And also, he felt that programmers were people that knew magically about everything and every, uh, that they knew all the syntax of every programming languages and uh, they could just code magically. And uh, at some point, we were talking about something because we needed someone to help review some front-end, and I don't have a lot of front-end skills and say, James, you do have some front-end skills. Can you look at that? I was like, yeah, but you know, I'm not really confident. I say, you know more than I do. Um, say, okay, uh, fine, but I don't know about that. So, okay, sure, let's Google it. And we say, okay, you actually just program using Google. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, that's actually a good thing to learn is that it's not like a, a mystery and we all like to appear like we know everything, but that's not true. We like to program with Stack Overflow and Google like, uh, like everybody and just uh, demystifying it, uh, it's also a good 
good way to make people understand that uh, they might not be afraid. But yeah, this breaking down for things is also work for, for uh, teaching um, the teachers. Um, so so I just, uh, there is a very nice term, demagification. And this is basically what we want to do. We want to show there is no magic behind it. Yeah, like there is, it's, it's simple. You have to break it down and this is how it works. And people who do it are not magicians. They're just like humans like everyone else. Yeah, and they learn it through making mistakes. Um, yeah, so one thing that I find really useful to see is live coding examples because you're going to make so many errors and so many typos and possibly even just get completely lost and have to Google something at one point. And it's so useful seeing the people who you think are just like magicians and know everything. They also make mistakes too. Um, so I think that's really helpful to have. Thank you. Uh, you okay? You Okay. What, what, what session is it? Uh, op on, on tooling. Okay, okay. thank yeah. you very much. Uh, I think uh, for your second question about the uh, feedback, one thing that you try to do is like ask people to feel the feedback when they are still uh, on the workshop room because this increases the numbers. Uh, about the other question, I don't have any magic bullet for you, but uh, I'm going to pass if people have any good experience. I wanted, I wanted to say something about how we gather feedback in, uh, in software carpentry workshops. This is my teaching with some pens, but we, th there is something that we use a lot in software carpentry workshops. These are the post-it notes, uh, and we use them like Ranier mentioned for, to see, for example, if people need help, then they put the pink sticky or red sticky uh, and the helper will come over and without disturbing the whole group uh, will help solve the problem. If we want to know if people solved all the exercises or like are up to speed, they put the yellow sticky. But we also do, uh, we ask people to put feedback after the workshop on there. So they put positive feedback on the yellow one and the negative on the, on the pink one. But the thing that works the best is uh, one up, one down, we call it. Uh, and it's, we ask, everyone in the group for feedback, but we ask one person for positive, so the good thing and the thing to improve is the next person, but they're not allowed to repeat after, them, after the previous person. So uh, after a while you come up with like more deep things uh, and they can't escape, yeah? So the, like we're not going to let them leave the room before they say, <laughs> give some feedback there, yeah. Oh yeah, I completely agree with that. It works well. Uh, so in software teams, actually, we use things like uh, retrospective after the sprints. Um, and I did once uh, a thinking hat type of retrospective, where at some point you have 10 minutes and people are forced to only say negative things about how it happened. I could see my team starting to melt down, like, I don't want to say negative things. <laughs> and actually, that's how we get the most useful feedback to, to help us grow as a team and work better. So yeah. Completely agree with that. Um, just um, another point on feedback. So uh, we are programming online games, so it's quite difficult to just see people interacting. So we put a lot of emphasis on user experience and having a user researcher in the team that will talk to teachers, to kids, to understand how we can make things better. So just continuous feedback, really. Uh, but yeah, it's quite 
difficult to do that because sometimes people just won't say, uh, say bad things to you, so you have to say before, like, even you lie and you say, I didn't program that, you can say if it's shit, and they will, sorry, it's just <laughs> bad world, uh, they, will, uh, they, will, they will not necessarily tell you, so you have to pay attention to that. Uh, so that's why anonymous feedback can also work, so if they put their comment on uh, post-it notes at the end of the session uh, without you watching it, uh, they might be more honest. Um, Yeah, I forgot in the meantime. Uh, <laughs> ah, yeah, so I, I think it also helps to rephrase it instead of having positive and negative. Uh, it could be what went well and take a look at, for example, and it's much easier to say something, take a look at, than I'm going to be negative now and tell you. Yeah? Uh, and question? Uh, yeah. Um, I'll just say, so for undergraduate lectures, they used to hand out feedback forms and it was like at least two sides of paper and they were like, oh, bring it to the next lecture and hand it in or put it in this pigeonhole on the other side of campus and I never did that because it's just like, no. I think the only times I filled it in was when I had really awful lecturers and you'd just be like, this was terrible, I learned nothing, you were awful. Um, so yeah, just making it really easy and having like limiting the number of questions. So if you want to find something out, kind of prioritize and only put the really important ones because people are lazy and they're not going to tell you things unless you make it easy for them. I know that we have two questions there, but we are almost out of time. So I'm going to ask you to answer your two questions over lunch after the talk. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, and when I'm organizing, I try to pass all the feedback to anyone that's helping me. Uh, just to connect uh, with your question and try to finish this. Uh, as we know, there's many groups worldwide that are trying to develop lessons to teach people, but this collaborative part of developing the lesson can be quite challenging. So this is going to be my last question to all, all the, the panelists. If you have a magical lamp, and the genius is going to give you one wish uh, to solve or improve how people develop in lessons collaborative, what are you going to ask for the genius? Okay. Uh, so what I, uh, what I would ask uh, in terms of lesson development, I would s say, like, stop people from writing their own lecture materials that they keep in their shelves. This is like the most, like this is so much time, like the time in the world is wasted for, like you have all those lectures, they will prepare the lecture that will get outdated the next year, they won't share it, they don't, don't yeah, they, like no one can reuse it. I think this is super wasteful. Uh, for me, I would say also um, something to help you put your ego away a bit when you're teaching. <laughs> so some people can, if, without noticing, they might sound arrogant, etc. And that's also, we're talking about the fears, but this fear can be ingrained if you hear your teacher saying things like, oh yeah, that's not real programming, but we'll do that after, or uh, oh, <coughs> where did you do that? Or sometimes you can't catch yourself doing that, but uh, that's good if you try to put your ego away and to make sure that you don't sound arrogant, that you sound inclusive, that you don't uh, judge uh, what people have been doing because then that just probably is why people fear of being of looking stupid okay uh, so uh, there is a uh, two, two announcements uh, uh, what time is your uh, open session two today two 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 forty five and then there is another open session for education uh, at yeah. what time Open sessions for education.
So if you want to continue this discussion, there's two open sessions. Just look on the board on them how. And a round of applause to all you that was an audience and just make this panel much better. Thank you very much. Thank you.